So one of the things I like about physics is it gives one an opportunity to comment on why, you know, wh why things are the way they are, uh, sort of foundational questions. And, you know, one of the themes in the last 50 years in that direction has been emergence. Um, you know, some theory is supposed to emerge from other physics at higher energy, emerge at lower en energy. And all the theories that we discuss, uh, foundational theories, uh, of course, are interacting theories. And what I want to talk to you about today is a mathematical possibility for understanding the emergence of interaction itself. You know, how could uh, interacting physics emerge from something simpler? Well, what's something simpler would be like uh, freshman quantum mechanics, uh, single particle quantum mechanics. Actually, as much as I enjoy these masks, it's sort of fogging my glasses and then I can't see you. Uh, the masks are great for high altitude training, I think. <laughs> suck in the air. Uh, but uh, other than that, I'm not sure. <clears throat> uh, so this emergence uh, that I want to discuss will be a, uh, a kind of a novel application of a familiar idea of spontane spontaneous symmetry breaking. Uh, and basically, it'll be a single particle uh, quantum mechanics will break to um, interacting physics. So let me um, first review uh, symmetry breaking in its, uh, in its sort of more familiar context, uh, which is <clears throat> symmetry breaking of states. Uh, an example, let me give three examples. Uh, <clears throat> the, uh, something called the Curie temperature. If you, for instance, uh, start cooling iron below about 1,000 degrees Kelvin, at some point the magnetic moments of the iron atoms align. And you, you get magnetic domains, which might be a few thousand atoms across or a few million atoms across, depending on how quickly you cross that transition. So, you know, basically, this is sort of like a freezing, a crystallization. So here, symmetry breaking leads to a crystal. Uh, it's called spontaneous because you haven't prejudiced by an external field necessarily which way they were going to align. Before they all freeze together, they kind of point any which way, so it has full rotational symmetry. But then that's vastly reduced when they all pick one direction. Uh, another example is um, the uh, uh, Ginzburg-Landau uh, theory, which led to an understanding of uh, superfluids and superconductors before there was a known microscopic mechanism, before uh, you know, the, the pairing mechanism. So this led to superconductors. And an example from high energy, which is a little bit different sort of symmetry breaking, the, the gauge symmetry, Higgs, uh, leads to you know, mass of other particles. So this is, List is just meant to convince that uh, interesting things happen when you break symmetry. And I want to talk about breaking symmetry, but today uh, or tonight, the symmetry breaking will be on the level of operators rather than states. And as you'll see when I get to this point in the talk, it's actually even not really breaking on symmetry breaking of operators, it's symmetry breaking of a certain, of a metric on a Lie algebra of a symmetry group, which leads to a breaking of a distribution, which leads to breaking of operators. So I'll explain that sequence in due course. Uh, so the starting point is the, um, the starting point for us will be the GUE, the uh, 
Gaussian unitary ensemble of Hermitian matrices, which is a probability distribution. It's a density, which is uh, the probability of a Hamiltonian, drawing a Hamiltonian, is some normalization constant e to the minus L2 norm of the Hamiltonian squared. Some people may recognize this, may write it as a trace of h squared. That's the same thing. So this is a, um, I would call this the single particle distribution on Hamiltonians. There's, it's sort of completely undifferentiated. Any, in dimension n, any n by n Hermitian matrix is pulled out of this distribution with its entries IID, identically independently distributed according to a Gaussian. Its diagonal entries are pulled out that way and its real and imaginary parts of its off diagonal entries are pulled out from the same distribution. It does not know anything about interacting physics. It's, it's um, I would say it's the undifferentiated uh, template for Hamiltonians. And you notice it's based on a, a metric. I called it the L2 metric. It's based on a metric on all Hamiltonians, which is a very symmetrical metric. You could think of it as the round metric. It's just the metric which assigns a, a length to the Hamiltonian, which is the sum of the square root of the sum of the squares of its entries. So that's the geometry which leads to the GUE. But there are other geometries um, that are possible uh, and other, other metrics, other metrics, I'll just call the metric GIJ, on the space of Hamiltonians. So let's just call them the Hermitian matrices in dimension n, so n by n Hermitian matrices. Other metrics on this um, uh, vector space will lead to other distributions. They'll lead to a new probability distribution, which is based on G, which would be up to normalizations, e to the minus, well, the length of the Hamiltonian in that metric, the length squared in that metric, which would be g i j contracted with the components of the Hermitian matrix in its basis. So the index there represents the basis that I write down the matrix in. So if I change the metric on the space of Hermitian matrices, I change the notion of a random matrix. And uh, I want to give an example of a second choice of uh, metric just to kind of you know, put us, as they say, on the same page. By the way, I hate that corporate terminology. I think we should all be on different pages. Uh, so uh, this example actually motivated my interest in this subject. And it's um, the last reference I put on the whiteboard, uh, the brown Susskind paper, the second law of uh, quantum complexity. Uh, and they talk about what they call the penalty metric. So, Well, I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm lumping its indices together. If you like, I is a double index and J is a double index. And, and the normalization is, in your previous example is that the, each, the variance of each entry is a uh, y Yes, I, I, the usual thing to do is to draw them independently distributed Gaussian variables of variance one. We assume that the variance of each column is one. E each individual entry in the matrix. The it, yes. Hmm. Well, there we go. Yeah, so let me, let me give you uh, an example of a second metric, which I'll call the uh, brown Susskind penalty metric. It's called penalty because it penalizes high body interactions. So in order to explain this metric on Hamiltonians, uh, let me first say what the, uh, Hermi the Hermitian matrices are. So the 
Hermitian two by two matrices are the span of uh, the identity matrix and poly X, poly Y, and poly Z. I'm guessing at this point those letters are familiar. This conference, okay. And if I look at the um, Hermitian matrices in a power of two, this is simply uh, the tensor product of n copies of the Hermitian matrices which are two by two. And whereas these were poly matrices, x, y, and z, a nice convenient basis using this tensor decomposition would be poly words of length n. So th the basis here is the span of the poly words. So a poly word might look something like identity, identity, x, identity, z, y, more identities a total of n of these. And I'm, I'm not writing, but I'm thinking tensor product between each of these uh, symbols. And that's a orthonormal basis with respect to the usual L2 or killing inner product. Uh, and we'll just, we can think in terms of that basis. And then this brown Susskind metric uh, G, IJ, is uh, delta IJ, so it's diagonal on this basis. But then it's some exponential, I'll just say e, to the minus uh, the weight of the ith word. So what is the weight? The weight is the number of, non, number of x, y, z letters in the poly word. So this example I wrote for you had weight three. So what does this metric do? Oh, actually, sorry, I often think of the metrics inverse, but for the metric, I want a plus sign here, not a minus sign. So I want the um, metric to charge more, to say you're longer in the metric. You measure longer if you have three letters in there instead of two letters. And this metric is remarkably very congenial to people who interest, are interested in quantum compiling, how to write a program. Uh, for a quantum computer and for studying black hole physics. The authors were more interested in black hole physics when they wrote this paper in 2017, but in the last four years, the distinction between quantum compiling and black hole physics seems to have completely disappeared. <laughs> they seem to be the same subject. So the idea of this metric from a uh, compiling sense is that we think it's harder to build gates that involve uh, more inputs and outputs maybe exponentially harder with the number of inputs and outputs. So a, ve a metric like this might re represent an appropriate measure of distance to get to a certain unitary which does the job you want, like factors numbers, you know, like the Shor algorithm unitary. How long does it take to make that unitary as a composition of gates? This would be a good measure. But of course it's infinitesimal, it's not discrete. So this is more like the Mike Nielsen point of view on quantum compiling, that you should understand it instead of discrete steps, you should think of it as Hamiltonian evolution, and this is telling you how expensive it is to evolve in certain directions. And you might go to even a more extreme kind of cliff metric, where it's infinitely hard to have three qubit gates, and you have to build everything up by bracketing two qubit gates, and that's, that's kind of an extreme version of this metric. And the connection with black hole physics is it seems that um, in order to understand various time scales of black hole evolution, you should think of information propagating. You, you should ask, how does the state of the black hole evolve in time? And if you let it evolve with the original killing or ad invariant metric, the L2 metric that I started with, um, the time scales would be much too short. Things would happen too fast. But if you look at the Lie group, the symmetries of the Hilbert space, SUN, and you give it this penalty metric, it has exponentially large diameter in N, whereas the standard symmetrical metric, it's like 2 pi. So a metric like this is appropriate if it's going to take a long time for complexity to evolve in time. Are you imagining a time independent? Yeah, well, well it, 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 um, no, no, not necessarily. 
Either way. E either way. You can ask what's the diameter of the group if you're allowed to navigate. But you just pay according to integrated arc length. So, so every time you choose a Hamiltonian? It, it's a time-dependent Hamiltonian. It's like driving your car in the Lee group. And then you have a bill at the end that you have to pay, which is sort of how, how far you went. So in order to get the time scales to work out with various other predictions, th this seemed like a very attractive metric to them. But it got me thinking about you know, where qubits come from in the first place uh, in this black hole discussion. And I, what I, I want to point out about a metric like this is let's just go through the steps. We start with the uh, brown Susskind metric. And then we can make from that a, a, a Gaussian distribution based on that metric. And I think I wrote the formula earlier. It's just you measure length squared in the new metric instead of the L2 metric. So that gives you a new probability distribution on the space of Hamiltonians. And then using that probability distribution, you draw from it a Hamiltonian. And what you'll see when you draw this Hamiltonian at random is it won't look like a Hamiltonian you drew from the GUE. It will look like it's interacting physics. This Hamiltonian will look interacting. And what that means is that with respect to the tensor structure in which we wrote this basis, most of the mass of this Hamiltonian, most of its L2 weight, will be represented in small body interactions. It'll be very rare to draw something there that looks like it's million body interactions. So now I want to think of this whole process as drawing H, but H is now going to be the Hamiltonian of our universe. So something like the uh, uh, Hartle-Hawking Hamiltonian or something like that. I want, I want to ask. You know, we live in an interacting universe. How did it come, how, how might that have come to be? What could cause, like, the most symmetrical possibility for selecting Hamiltonians to be rejected, and instead Hamiltonians are drawn from a different distribution? And that's where the uh, symmetry breaking idea will come in. That, uh, that will, uh, uh, I'll explain how symmetry can be broken and lead to something like the uh, brown Susskind uh, uh, metric on, on, uh, on uh, Hermitian operators and hence a probability distribution on Hamiltonians. OK, so uh, uh, in order to do this, it's now time to sort of start the math and just give you a definition. Can I, can I ask you one thing? Yeah. Um, so when the, your first metric, yeah, the Killing factor. Do you want to think of those Hamiltonians as non-interacting? Yeah, yeah, actually, there's a historical irony here, which maybe is, I'm guessing, is your question, that Wigner introduced the GUE because he wanted to model complex interaction, and he had no way of disentangling it except on the basis of symmetry class. So in 1956, GUE was introduced um, to represent interacting physics. But it only represents interacting physics on a very superficial level in terms of the statistics of the spectrum. You get the semicircle law. If you look more deeply, if you look at entanglement measures and so on, it's not representing interacting physics at all. Did I guess your question? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so what I wanted to find just first is the notion of a qubit structure on a Hilbert space that initially has none. But let's assume for convenience, and we'll step away from this later, that the space that doesn't have qubit structures has dimension a power of two, so it could have a qubit structure. We'll talk about what happens in other cases soon. So suppose we have a space that happens to be a power of two of dimension. And then what a qubit structure is, is an isomorphism, J, from qubits, from n qubits. So choosing an isomorphism from left to right here 
is what I'm going to call a qubit structure. And it determines um, an isomorphism, which I'll call little j, from the Hermitian matrices, which are two by two, tensored up n times, to the Hermitian matrices on the large scale. So before I mentioned that these two were isomorphic, but the choice of the isomorphism is given by the choice of the qubit structure on the large space. So with that definition, I can come to the fundamental definition, which is we say a metric gij on uh, Hermitian, sorry, uh, yeah, let me use the dimension 2 to the n, and 2 to the n by 2 to the n. We say that such a metric um, is CAC, and this is an acronym for knows about qubits. Okay, so the metric knows about qubits if there is a uh, basis uh, uh, of principal, uh, principal axes for the metric, I'll call that basis HK, because of course they are Hamiltonians. They're vectors, but they're, they're in the space of Hermitian matrices. Um, if there's a basis such that for some fixed little j is above, each one of these, HK, is J of the tensor product um, 1, K, N, K. OK, so let's, let, let's first absorb the definition. Uh, what does a metric look like? You know, how do you picture a metric, a metric? A metric should be thought of as some kind of ellipsoid tells you how long it is to go in different directions. That's what a quadratic form is. Of course, in order to draw it as an ellipsoid, you really need a background notion of geometry, and that's where I'm using the L2 norm. Otherwise, you just draw it round. You'd have nothing to compare it to. But when I talk about the principal axes, I'm thinking the principal axes of this ellipsoid drawn in the uh, with respect to the L2 geometry. Now, if you're not comfortable with principal axes and like eigenvalues better, if I just take the metric gij and I raise one of the indices to make it an operator, I raise it using the killing form, the add invariant metric, then the principal uh, axes just become the eigenvectors. So, what I'm asking for, I'm saying a metric knows about qubits if all its special directions, all the principal directions of this metric, actually are tensor products in some fixed qubit um, structure. So you don't get to change the qubit structure. For instance, if we did this with, if we thought about the Lie algebra of SU4, we'd be looking at Hermitian four by four matrices, and I put a little zero there for the S, we're taking out the identity matrix. So it turns out this is 16 minus one, this is 15 dimensional. So there'd be 15 principal axes if there was no degeneracy. And I'm only saying that a, a metric on SU4 is CAC, knows about qubits, if by some miracle all 15 of its principal uh, axes Factor <laughs> as tensor products. It's kind of like a one in a million thing. It's not going to happen at random. 
And in fact, if you do dimension counting, you see asymptotically as the dimension four increases, um, CAC metrics are about square root uh, common in the sense of dimension. So I'd call that square root common. That is, if I have a space of metrics which is about a million dimensional, the variety of CAC metrics inside it is up to log factors like thousand dimensional. I mean, even a co-dimension one variety, you have measure zero of hitting at random, but this is very thin variety. So it'll be quite astonishing that we, and I'll present numerical results that symmetry breaking lands, you know, up to numerical precision, like three decimal places into CAC metrics. It's not, it's not kind of an accident. Okay, so uh, that's the one definition you have to remember. Uh, <clears throat> so now symmetry breaking is always associated with some kind of potential or functional. So we have to define a potential, and I'll call it delta for a reason you'll see in a moment, which will go from M, and M will be my notation for the space. This will be uh, metrics. This will be GIJs or metrics on Hermitian, traceless Hermitian n by n matrices. So, the sp so by the way, that's fourth power of n. The Hermitian matrices are like n squared many, n squared over two, and the um, metrics on it, of course, is another square. So this is fourth degree in m, and this will be a potential function to r. And what I'll be looking at is, I draw this as a single axis here, but this is this very high dimensional space of metrics M. And what we'll find is some, well, some kind of, it's not that wiggly, it's a function. Oh, oh you can't erase like that, sorry. Oh. All right, we'll find some function that has a lot of, it'll have a local maximum. The functions I talk about usually will have a local maximum at the add invariant um, or the L2. I sometimes call it L2 and I sometimes call it killing. I call it killing when I think of it as a metric on the skew Hermitian matrices on the Lie algebra. I call it L2 when I think of it on the Hermitian matrices. But you can always put an I in to change back and forth. But what we'll find is that many of these local minima that we find when we consider the, an energy function, I'll think of it as sort of a pseudo energy delta, many of these are CAC. You know, when I say many, like after hundreds and hundreds of finding local minima by extensive computer searches, probably maybe even thousands of local minima, probably 20 or 30 percent are CAC. It's a order one fraction. So, right. Is this delta? Yeah, let me give you, I didn't say. So let me give my favorite example of delta. The favorite example of delta, but it's not the best one for computation because there's no expansion parameter. But the best example of delta theoretically is the Ricci scalar. So let me just ask, does everyone see immediately why the Ricci scalar is a functional on metrics? So the point is that a metric on Hermitian matrices is equivalently, as I just mentioned, a metric on the Lie algebra of, of SUN. And a metric on the Lie algebra is the same as a left invariant metric on the entire group. And in Ramanian geometry, as soon as you put a Ramanian metric on the group, you can start talking about curvature. And then the scalar curvature is, the Ricci scalar curvature is a number that you get by contracting up all the indices of the Riemann tensor. And it's very simply expressed in terms of the two input tensors. There's only two tensors in the game. We have the structure constants, C, I, J, K, of the Lie algebra, and we have the metric which in, might be the brown suskin metric or some other metric, GIJ. And then, of course, we have the inverse metric, G upper IJ. And the Ricci scalar is actually represented by this diagram, these diagrams. The Ricci scalar is, I have just room to write it here, it's minus one quarter, this diagram, minus one-half uh, this diagram, 
And I don't know if this uh, notation is, this diagrammatic notation is completely familiar to everyone. It's sort of Feynman notation. By the way, I didn't find this in the literature, but we computed this from uh, Milner's article on left invariant metrics on Lie groups. But what this means in terms of, you know, written out in coordinates is each one of these Y-shaped things is, of course, a copy of the three tensor. And the curvy lines, whether they're up or down like this, are copies of the metric or the inverse. So for instance, this diagram writes out to C i j k C i prime j prime k prime. Now we have to contract the indices. So g i i prime g j j prime, and then lower indices to contract the k's. That's the, what that diagram is explicitly. And this diagram, let's just do that one too. I, J, K, K is the index on top. So, the, hmm. any guesses how to get rid of this? What I just touch it? Okay. Um, so the top index went to the right index. So that means I should put a K here. This J index went to the top. So this is a j here. And this index here would be an i prime. And that would have to get contracted with a copy of the metric inverse. OK. So th th this is just what the Ricci scalar is. It's some number. And of course, it's the same curvature at every point because it's a homogeneous space. So here's the amazing thing. If you say, well, we're going to kind of consider this as an energy functional on left invariant metrics. It has an addition to the a maximum at the most symmetrical metric, which is kind of a roundish metric. Uh, it's a positive, non-negative curved metric on the Lie group. But the metric gets all floppy and has negative sections and becomes quite long and stretched out in different places as you vary this metric. And very quickly, you get all kinds of minima some of which we were able to look up in the differential geometry literature and then find numerically after spotting them in the literature. And some we found by just searching with random seeds using a lot of machine learning. And uh, not me, but uh, Moji uh, did the machine learning. So now, now this is just representative, I, I said. The actual functionals, I'll show you. Um, I'll, I'll show you uh, in the transparency. Oh, yes. So you're interested in tax metrics because they know about qubits, I guess that's how it is. But my question is, I would think that you're further interested in tax metrics that are sort of like the penalty metrics. Well, yes, but the point is, our numerics, I mentioned this end of the fourth. We have to search metrics over a space that's about end of the four dimensional. So the limits of our successful computer work has been three qubits, n equals eight. So the decay with high body is something that's only barely visible to us. So your hope might be that yes. Okay. Yes, it, that is our hope. So I'm going to go now to some data slides. But before I do that, the last thing I want to write uh, is just to remind you of the, the sequence of uh, events. So the first event is we pick a, um, a delta, which is like our functional on metrics. And then from that, uh, we get to a minimum. We find a gij, which is a minimum or a local minimum. And then from that, we create a probability distribution, which is the Gaussian based on that metric. And then we sample, we draw from that probability distribution, and that's how we get our Hamiltonian. So that's, how, that's the proposal for, you know, in this toy model for the universe's Hamiltonian. And now um, what I want to uh, show you uh, next is actually, you know, what are these, um, you know, what are the deltas that are most useful to us? What do we find? So for that, let me, uh, oops. Let me pull up my PowerPoint. Good. Oh, it worked. Okay, so um, this shows the, is it too small to read? Okay. The person in the front row said he could read it. Uh, so, so this <laughs> this functional, if you can read it, 
it's, um, it's kind of faux physics. You know, what we did is um, we took like the first few pages of a standard text in field theory where they teach you how to write perturbative expansions for uh, perturbed Gaussians. So what we plot is the G, the metric, that looks like a quadratic term. And the Cijk, that looks like a cubic term. So, you know, these aren't scalars, these are tensors. But what we asked ourselves is, what is the simplest finite dimensional integral of that form that we can write down, um, which we could then use as a functional on, uh, on the space of metrics, since, you know, G is in there. And if you just write down the very first thing you think of, it turns out that the cubic correction just vanishes uh, identically because of the skew symmetry of the first two indices, Cij and Cji give you the same value. So to prevent that, you have to do some kind of tripling of the state where you throw in a vector three times. So th th that's this formalism where x is three copies of y. So I won't belabor this. I'm just saying that I'm, I believe this is the simplest perturbed Gaussian that you can make out of those two tensors to get a number. And um, it gives you, we can take a look at its real imaginary part as possible functionals. And we gave them nicknames. We called, I think one of them, you'll see in the later notes, is like the 2, 4 functional and the other is the 2, 6. And that was just to remind us how many vertices were in the Feynman diagrams up to where we truncated them. So when we actually threw this on the computer, of course, we only used the beginning of the perturbative expansion. And uh, hidden in that formula is an expansion parameter k. And by, making, uh, by, ch by varying k, we get more flexibility than we had with scalar curvature. And we use that to do a little better job of searching out uh, local minima. But that's, th this was kind of the workhorse functional. And then a very quick summary of what we found in SU4 is this slide. Uh, the ellipses on the left are labeled as CAC, and the ellipses on the right are labeled as SUB. Because one thing we realized early on is that we might get some false positives. We might get some, the symmetry might break, not break to something that particularly is concerned about qubits, but it might be concerned about some sub Lie algebra that it likes to point uh, Hamiltonian terms in. You know, for instance, SUN might break down to SON, or SU2N might break down to SPN. And we did find examples of that. So it isn't that it doesn't happen. And very often, because you can write generators for these special Lie sub algebras with poly representatives, it turns out that they can be interpreted as knowing about qubits. But we thought they were a little bit illegitimate because they had another interpretation as having found this different sub Lie algebra. So we, in order to be honest, we highlighted the things we found uh, according to the suspicious ones that might have a different explanation. We put those in the left ellipses. So in, in this dimension, um, I guess everything we found by scalar curvature was in the intersection of the two. But when we used the 2, 6 functional, we found, well, actually in both cases, we found uh, some things that were strictly CAC. We found a symplectic thing that was both. Uh, the 2, 4 functional, we found many. We also found an interesting thing, which we're starting to explore now in much more detail. We found the Majorana pattern, you know, which it looks like a list of binomials. That is, if you take four Majoranas, that'll generate a 16-dimensional space. And if you throw away the identity of the 15-dimensional space. So you might imagine that you might get de degeneracies of the principal axis of, of the um, eigenspaces according to some pattern based on whether you were seeing operators that could be written as one, two, three, or four Majoranas. And we actually did see that. That was one of our patterns. So parallel to the qubit discussion, there's a Majorana discussion, which involves a different kind of decomposition. Uh, the, what the asterisk means, I, I should read it to you, it says slightly delicate here. And what that means is that this local minimum that had the Majorana pattern was not persistent as we varied the expansion parameter. We varied it between like 100 and 400. Sometimes it came in and sometimes it went out. 
Then we went to SU8, because we're looking for qubit structures. And again, we found a lot of patterns. And actually, this slide is not updated. We have about six more patterns that we have found in the last month. Uh, oh, I should tell you what these long strings of numbers means. I didn't explain that. So let me just go back. Um, if you see a pattern like this, this CAC pattern, 31182, if you add up those numbers, you'll get 15. Yeah, yeah, uh, that worked? Yeah, okay, good. So 15 is the dimension of the Lie algebra of SU4. And what this means is that we didn't have, uh, it broke into, I'll call these principal directions eigenspaces, thinking of as raising the index. The eigenspaces were not all one dimensional. That would be a one, one, one. We found up to numerical precision some of the eigenspaces degenerate. So this means we found a three dimensional one, a one dimensional one, eight, and two. And the reason we write them in that order is that is the order according to the easiness of the direction, like the low bodiness, so to speak. It's the, in, in the Brown Susskind terms. So the, the larger eigenvalues we list first down to the shorter ones. So for example, if the pattern breaks as 10 and 5, is that, that means 10 is easy and 5 is a hard direction to move in. And that corresponds to the fact that the symplectic subalgebra is 10 dimensional. So it's like SU4 says, I'm 15 dimensional, but there's 10 easy directions I'm going to be free to move in, and five expensive ones, which are like kind of the analogy of high body in this Brown Susskind world. So it's actually more interesting that it came out as 10-5 rather than 5-10, because you expect it to pick out the easy directions to move in. So hopefully, they'd be associated with the sub Lie algebra. Um, OK, now, uh, the, the other thing I wanted to say before leaving 4 and 8 is you might, we make numerical measurement of whether it's CAC or not. It's just not a yes or no thing. The way I wrote the definition down for you, either there was a tensor decomposition or not. But obviously, there's, these are, this is numeric. So you have to have some tolerance. And the really striking thing is we've never found an example where we didn't know if it was a good tensor decomposition or not. Typically, two or three orders of magnitude separate the ones for, that are tensor factors from the ones that are not tensor factors. So we, we use some entropy measure to see whether it's, it breaks up as a tensor. You know, it's the um, reduced, the entropy of the reduced um, density functional. All right, we take partial trace and we see what the entropy is. And what we find is that the entropy is either tiny, it's really almost zero up to two or three decimal places, or it's order one. Uh, OK, now, that was sort of the content of our first paper, which was posted at the end of the year last year. But this year, we decided to explore the numbers between 4 and 8. Yes? Can I ask why you think your functionals are picking out these tasks? Yes. Great. That's a good question. Um, I think that the answer is, uh, if you have a any kind of reasonably natural functional, and you minimize it, the structure that minimizes it will be rather rich quite often. For example, if you, um, if you give some kind of repulsion potential to particles and ask for the minimum, uh, you may end up with the E8 lattice or the Leach lattice. In fact, that's a rigorous theorem these days that for a continuous family of energy potentials, there's a unique solution in dimension 8 and 24. So I think, what, I think this is of a similar ilk. That is, we put, out, we put out a functional that's more or less natural, and the structure that minimizes it is going to um, uh, have a lot of symmetry, internal symmetry, just you know, like the leech lattice has the monster group symmetry. So, I think that's what we're finding. So I think nature likes these tensor structures. And in fact, this slide is very much apropos, the next, this one here, because even when we put in things that aren't powers of two, what we find is that 
Well, for instance, when you put in six, it's not such a big surprise that it factors as C2 tensor C3. That's just replacing one of the qubits with a trit. That's kind of a, a boring generalization. But what I think is more interesting is when you put in five, what it will do, and maybe I should go to the data slide for five, SU5, so now there are 24 vectors that have to line up. And I think the ellipses on the left represented one of the functionals, and we found nothing, two, four, and ellipses on the right represented the two, six functional. What we find is patterns where it, what we call almost CAC, and what it does is it just ejects a one dimension from the five. So what should be five by five Hermitian matrices, they break up uniformly with the same decomposition as a four by four block, and you get kind of garbage on the margin, and inside the four by four block, you have a, a, a tensor product to high precision of two times two. So this is what we call the leaky universe scenario. So you can imagine that the universe started with some single particle with a tremendously high number of degrees of freedom, or a big Hilbert space, but it wasn't a power of two, or factored in some nice way in terms of small primes. So there is sort of a, a repertoire uh, number of dimensions that just had to be pushed aside. And the rest of the universe could sort of coalesce into interacting degrees of freedom. And this is sort of an unnerving thought, because if you do a little number theory, you, it turns out that, actually, here's an interesting little number theory problem you can work on. Um, how common are numbers that are powers of two? Well, they're not that common. They get farther and farther apart, right? But how common are numbers that are, their prime factorization only consists of twos and threes? Turns out those are vastly more common. It turns out that you only have to round down by approximately log of the number before you hit something of that kind. And if you have three primes in there, it's uh, one over log squared, conjecturally. That's, that's not known, but the log statement is. So you can imagine that log many of the dimensions um, got left out if things had to break into small primes. And the part that broke into primes, that turned into our, kind of our universe. And the, ev the evolution in it looks um, unitary as far as we can tell, because there's only this one over log of this huge number error in, uh, you know, the, the part of the, the rows only, over the rows only leave the tensor product block on a very small fraction of their entries. So it looks to all intents and purposes as if it's unitary evolution on the block, even though it's truncated, it's unitary evolution in the big matrix. But still, you'd have some overlap with these um, uncoalesced states that aren't part of interacting physics. And it, it seems rather frightening if your wave function should overlap with those states that aren't even part of our interacting world. It, it seems like it could not be healthy. Uh, so that's that sort of universe with a leak. And, uh, and we did the same experiment. So here's six. I, I didn't show you the data, but six produced a lot of factorings into two and three. And seven actually produced many interesting factorings. And some of them, seven split as six, so two times three plus one. And in some of these patterns, it split as two times two plus three. So it seems like it was comfortable ejecting uh, different amounts of material. Uh, see the last slide. Oh, this is just some additional data on SU8. I, I won't go through that. So um, let, let me just try to summarize um, and you know then take some questions. Uh, so. Yeah, so there, I think there are two things you might think about with um, numbers that are not powers of two. It, so one thing that we still have to understand better is whether powers of two are really special in some way or not, whether Clifford algebras, for example, play a role. And we'll be looking at SU8 in order to try to understand that. You know, maybe 
but ITERA preliminary data is that um, powers of two are not important and like six works in pretty much the same way as four or eight. Uh, but you might wonder, um, you might wonder whether if the, if the breaking has to go according to prime factors, if, it, if, if that was the only thing that would happen, then it would seem like there might be some very interesting information left over from the prime factorization of the original dimension. So in other words, if the original dimension of this hypothetical single particle was just some vastly large integer like Googleplex, you'd really be interested to know what is the statistics of factors of a random number selected in that range. You know, and it turns out number theorists know all about this. There's like a constant, it's called the gulab dickman constant, which just for your amusement says that if you have a thousand digit number taken at random, its largest prime factor will have 628 digits. It, so that number 0.628 is telling you on a logarithmic scale what the expected largest prime is, prime factor in a number. And th that's just like the tip of the iceberg. They know all about these things. So it's tempting to think if this is some kind of origin story, it's tempting to think, well, what residues of number theoretic facts like that might exist in the low energy world of string theory or something? Uh, but then the evidence that I just showed you is maybe prime factorization isn't such an important thing in the story because maybe this leaky universe idea works that maybe the system is happy to eject some inconvenient degrees of freedom and just really, really will break into small primes. So that's that's a hypothesis. Uh, and then we, we want to understand um, fermions, and Majorana fermions, whether that somehow coupled with Clifford algebras, whether that gives uh, uh, interesting decompositions. I'd say um, the, another thing that we have on our to-do list to look for is one isn't really just interested in isolation in what the initial Hamiltonian of the universe H0 is, it's the pair, the initial Hamiltonian and the initial state. You should really be looking for H0 comma psi zero because it's somehow the way they, those fit together that must explain what seems extraordinarily, extraordinarily special tuned about the way our universe evolves, you know, that it's constantly producing entropy and not coming to an end too fast. Uh, so that I think it would be very interesting to look at for symmetry breaking producing a pair. And that's actually trivial to do in our formalism because remember I showed you that Gaussian integral. All you have to do is add a source term to that Gaussian integral where the source term is a projector onto um, a, a state. And uh, then the diagrams, instead of being closed diagrams, will have that state in it. We can still evaluate those integrals. And then when we minimize them, we'll get pairs of G and and initial state. So we're quite interested to do that and see how entropy evolves over uh, intermediate time scales uh, under, the, under the symmetry broken Hamiltonian comma state. Uh, and then the last, the last project, which I wouldn't say is exactly on our to-do list because we don't know how to start it, is I haven't talked about spatial organization of these degrees of freedom yet. Uh, you know, you, one would like to conclude from this that the universe is 26 dimensional or something like that, right? Uh, you know, make contact with some other origin story. Uh, but, you know, that is hopelessly beyond uh, numerical, direct numerical study uh, because, you know, we can only deal with a small number, three or possibly four at the most qubits. We can't possibly look for the leech lattice to start forming or something like that. So we would definitely need an effective model for um, what the symmetry breaking is doing at sort of a larger scale. You know, a little bit like Watson, Crick, and uh, uh, Franklin, you know, studied DNA not with the quantum mechanics, which was new at the time, but by tinker toys. So we need, obviously, to reduce whatever we learn from quantum mechanical simulation into tinker toys, and then use the tinker toys to study large systems. 
we can't study them on a computer unless we build a quantum computer uh, so yeah maybe i'll call it good there thank you <laughs>